Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, the program um, that we're presenting today is part of the Cancer Wellness Center's Men's Health Education and Support Series, um, funded in part by a donation from Estellas. Today, we'll be talking about physical therapy perspectives um, in understanding the male pelvic floor and its role in cancer recovery. For those of you new to the center, we're a nonprofit organization aimed to improve the physical and emotional well being of those impacted by cancer as well as their families. We provide a variety of free programs and services, which include education programs like the one today, support services, and wellness classes. For more information, visit cancerwellness.org. And I'll put that in the chat as well. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, please note that you, or your audio will be disabled for the program. And if you have any questions, please submit them in the chat box. For those of you um, watching on Facebook, feel free to send them in the um, comment section and uh, those will be shared with the, uh, with the presenters at the end. Um, after the program, you will receive our evaluation and we ask that you take a few minutes to provide your feedback. We really appreciate it very much. Now, without further ado, I would like to welcome our presenters today. Elizabeth Wolf and Betsy Montgomery from North Shore University Health System. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me share our presentation and then we'll introduce ourselves. Let's see if this will go. Okay. So Thank you, Svina, for inviting us to present. Uh, my name is Betsy Montgomery. I am a physical therapist uh, at North Shore Glenbrook Hospital location. Um, I treat pi primarily pelvic floor and have done so for about five years. Um, I am board certified in pelvic health, so I treat men and women. I treat urinary incontinence, um, bowel issues, pelvic pain, genitourinary cancers, and um, I do see a lot of men with various pelvic cancers, so it's great to be here um, just sharing some information with you all today. Um, I am Elizabeth, or Liz Wolf, and I am at the North Shore Skokie location. Um, I also treat primarily pelvic health and also um, men and women and um, particularly treating men um, post prostatectomy is um, something that I'm very passionate about because of um, a lot of members of my family who I really love. Um, so I feel grateful for the opportunity to talk with everybody. And also, um, as Betsy said, just to share some information about what we do and how we can potentially help. All right. So just an overview of what we will cover today um, is basically what the, oops, what the pelvic floor is and what it does. General information on prostate, bladder, and colorectal health, various pelvic floor related symptoms that one might experience um, when dealing with those cancers or post-cancer recovery, and then you know, what we do in pelvic physical therapy and how we help promote recovery and reduce the symptoms associated with pelvic cancers. Um, so, let's see if I can. Um, so we wanted to just briefly cover the anatomy of the pelvic floor. And so basically this picture is showing us looking down into the pelvic floor. Um, as if you were to cut yourself in half and your trunk would be on top and your legs are on the bottom. So you can really see this bowl shape of muscles here. Um, it's really three muscles, which I have labeled, but um, they work as one unit and they contract to maintain continence and relax to allow for urination and defecation. Um, they are part of the core, so they do help promote um, hip stability, low back stability, um, so they do a lot. So certainly when we have cancer in this region, these muscles can definitely be impacted. Um, specifically with male anatomy in the photo on the right-hand side of the screen, um, this is if you were to be cut into a right and a left-hand side. You can see the pubic bone here, the bladder, the prostate, 
and the um, rectum here. And so the pelvic floor muscles do support those organs. And I would say the one thing that I think we take for granted sometimes when we look at these pictures is the fact that these muscles are really technically embedded or these organs are embedded in the muscles. So if you're having, for instance, a prostate removal, you know, there is some associated trauma to the muscles. And very often that's where we see some of the fallout in um, recovery. And the same goes here, this picture on the left with the rectum here. Um, I'll speak more to this later when we talk about colorectal cancer, but you can see that there is an internal anal sphincter, these blue dots here an external anal sphincter, an anal canal. And so certainly these structures in the anatomy um, dictate the function of those organs. And so when there is any surgery or anything that impacts the area, um, we see that there are very often are bowel and bladder issues associated. All right, Liz. Yeah, so prostate cancer. Um, the, the prostate is basically a ping pong sized gland that is located just under the bladder. And as Betsy said, you can see in this um, picture, just the relationship, not only to the bladder, but also to the urethra and um, the, uh, oh. I'm sorry, oops, I'm going no, you're okay, you're okay. Sorry, Liz. No, it's like a little preview. <laughs> Okay, so you can see um, the uh, relationship or the proximity of the uh, prostate to the urethra and also to the ejaculatory duct. So based on that location um, and also being right underneath your bladder, um, that can definitely um, create impact towards the pelvic floor and towards these structures. So the prostate um, supplies semen, which is important for reproduction, and it also supplies testosterone. There's a neurovascular bundle that sits right behind it, and that helps to provide um, innervation and blood flow um, and help control the function. So there's three zones in your prostate. You have the central, the peripheral, and the transitional, and they're nicely laid out in that picture. So the peripheral is where the majority of the cancer is gonna be located. And if you look at that purple area, again, you can kind of see that proximity um, or that relationship to the urethra. And then depending on you know which zone it's in, there's, um, more impact on different structures. So the location of the cancer can really have different features and there's different um, ramifications for treatment. So diagnosis of prostate cancer, there are biopsies taken from different zones. Um, and based on the severity of the cancer cells found, a number is assigned and it's added to calculate something called the Gleason score. So when the number is a little bit higher, it indicates that the cancer is more involved. And the PSA blood test um, generally will be over um, two for that. So, Prostate cancer is the most common cancer in men. It's very important to get screened for this. Um, in 2010, nearly 200,000 men were diagnosed with prostate cancer and almost 30,000 men died of it. So it mainly occurs in older men, usually 65 years and older, and the average age is 67. It's definitely rare before um, age 40. So if it's caught early, there's a very high survival rate, um, five year at 99%, 10 year at 98%, and 15 year at 93%. Um, some risk factors include age, as was mentioned, um, family history, race, ethnicity, it's most common in black men, um, a high fat diet, obesity, and smoking. So the things that we have the most control over, of course, are just having healthy lifestyle habits, 
um, including eating better diets, um, maintaining healthy weight, and of course, avoiding smoking. So for treatment, um, there are um, several options. So surgery wise, there is a radical retropubic um, where there is um, a larger incision and the prostate is removed. And generally speaking, this is if they are removing some of the surrounding structures also. Um, and then the robot assisted laparoscopic surgery um, where there's several incisions and it's a little bit of a um, more, um, it's a little bit less of an invasive type of surgery. But as far as the rate of urinary continence, there's not a major difference one year later with these two procedures. Um, and then there's also radiation, which you can see the picture below. Um, so there's an external beam where um, the radiation is targeted towards the area externally. And then the intensity modulated is more specific to the area. Um, and then brachytherapy, which is really um, can be in pellets that are inserted into the area. Um, and basically this um, substance that is, is inserted right by the prostate. And this is a little bit considered a little bit less um, invasive and has better outcomes. Um, and of course, the doctor would determine which of these is the most appropriate just based on the uh, diagnosis. So other treatments include androgen deprivation therapy, which is used to suppress testosterone. Um, this can be done as an additional treatment following surgery if there's a little bit more involvement. Um, it can also be done prior to surgery. Again, just depends on the status. Um, chemotherapy, which is often palliative, and again, similarly to the androgen deprivation therapy, can be done um, as additional treatment, um, especially if there's lymph involvement. And all of these can really impact the recovery and the long-term function, which is where PTs can help. So there are a lot of effects of prostate cancer treatment, and these don't necessarily apply to everybody, but it's good to be aware of these possibilities. Um, so in 87% of patients, there's going to be urinary dysfunction. I'm sorry, urinary incontinence. Um, and the majority of patients will um, regain this, but it can take oftentimes up to a year. Um, same thing with erectile dysfunction. This can take up to two years. Um, but if you can remember back at the anatomy um, slide part, there is that neurovascular bundle that's located right behind the prostate. And so depending on how the surgery goes or the type of surgery, those structures can be affected, which does impact um, the erectile dysfunction and the urinary. Um, of course, you can have pain um, either at the incision sites or sometimes pelvic type pain, um, osteoporosis, fatigue, weight changes and loss of muscle mass, um, sometimes cognitive changes, lymphedema, skin changes, particularly with radiation treatments, um, and bowel changes, typically diarrhea. Um, and Generally speaking, because of the tissue changes with um, radiation, that can also really impact uh, urinary incontinence as well. So um, urinary continence can vary post-op. Um, so 95% of men are continent at 12 months post-op, and we define that as using one pad or less in a 24-hour period. Um, and as PTs, the first um, portion of continence that improves is generally at night because you're not against gravity at that time. Um, it might also be impacted by the type of the surgery, involvement of other structures outside the prostate. Um, and again, depending on the involvement or the nature of the treatment, there may be different um, outcomes. 
So the more involved the surgery, the worse the outcome also with erectile dysfunction. Um, so that neurovascular bundle can be irritated or damaged. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's usually a two-year recovery if there's no radiation and often longer if it's radiation. So typically, um, doctors will prescribe medications, um, Cialis or Viagra, to start immediately postoperatively in order to restore blood flow to the penis, which is going to be really, really important. So PT interventions, um, preoperatively, I think it's nice to see people just to give them an idea of things that they can do postoperatively. Um, so practicing Kegels, which are just our pelvic floor muscle contractions, people are often surprised that men have pelvic floors too, um, but they do. So showing them how to do them properly and also um, specific number and frequency for patients to do after they've had surgery. Um, there is a little bit of a conflict as to the true benefit of this, um, but some doctors do prefer this. And I think it's nice because there's a lot of education involved and it helps to set up good expectations for what their recovery process is gonna be like. Um, and then of course, a lot of education on healthy habits, including fluid intake, bowel habits, and then safe activities postoperatively. So postoperatively, um, a visit to physical therapy um, would include a detailed subjective, which is just like the history that we take, just to get an idea of what their urinary function is like, um, and how it was prior to surgery, um, if there's any pain or bowel issues, um, and just to get an idea of what that person's goals and needs um, are. So we'll do a formal musculoskeletal assessment just to look at overall body strength, mobility, um, how their scar tissue looks. Um, and then at six weeks, we can do an internal rectal exam in order to really assess pelvic floor muscle function because ultimately in men, that is the best way to access the pelvic floors intrarectally. And then, and again, lots of education on good habits. And if needed, um, we can help train on the use of incontinence clamps, which are basically used to help retrain the bladder. Um, and we can address concerns on erectile function um, or other sexual health needs, and also recommend some resources if they need it. Um, and then of course, addressing muscle tension or pain in the pelvic floor or surrounding areas, um, which can also contribute to um, poor pelvic floor muscle activity. So um, in those areas, most commonly we'll see issues with scar tissue mobility and low back pain. So these are pelvic floor muscle contractions or Kegels. They're basically the same thing. They are the same thing. And the goal is to really restore pelvic floor and urethral sphincter muscle strength. So if you can remember in those anatomy slides, when you have a prostate, especially that's really enlarged, those structures really can, the urethra particularly, gets a lot of support from it, and the pelvic floor muscles can get weak. So it's really important to restore that strength so that there can be better support for the urethra and um, minimize any kind of urinary incontinence. So one of the things that we use a lot that's really effective is biofeedback. And what this does is it measures pelvic floor muscle activation. So when you squeeze your muscles, the line on the screen goes up. And when you relax your muscles, the line on the screen goes down. And oftentimes getting a visual is really, really helpful for people to um, know that they're doing things correctly. Um, and we're gonna help retrain the muscles to fire at appropriate times and again, improve strength. So the best cue for men, to Kegel according to the research in order to bias the, um, the area that we want um, is to shorten the penis and lift the scrotum. 
So the research shows that pelvic floor muscle exercises seem to result in an improved urinary continence and erectile function after radical prostatectomy. 50% um, of men who are unable to perform pelvic floor muscle contraction correctly. Um, so it's important to have this good instruction early. Um, earlier return to continence with biofeedback, um, which we talked about on the former slide, um, a single session of preoperative biofeedback and pelvic floor strengthening can hasten the recovery and decrease the severity of urinary incontinence following radical prostatectomy and preoperative pelvic floor physical therapy improves continence after a radical retropubic prostatectomy. So all good stuff. Benefits of physical therapy, um, just to name a few, it's not invasive, there's not side effects. It can um, create an earlier return to developing urinary continence, improved quality of life, decreased healthcare costs, and improving um, erectile function. So other treatments outside of physical therapy um, for incontinence, there is an artificial urethral sphincter which basically is um, attached to the abdomen, abdominal wall, and it helps to support the sphincter since it's lost that muscle strength. Um, I'm sorry, that's the urethral sling. Um, the artificial urethral sphincter is a cuff and you can um, use it manually um, with a pump that's located in the scrotal wall. And that also helps to minimize urinary incontinence. Um, other devices include clamps, which helps to retrain the bladder, um, catheters as needed, um, and then medication. So for erectile dysfunction, there are um, surgically um, created penile implants, penis pumps, and then also referrals to a sexual health um, physician or nurse. All right. Thank you, Liz. Um, so we are going to transition over into bladder cancer now. Um, bladder cancer certainly is not the most common cancer. And although we do treat it in pelvic floor therapy, it's not something that any of us really sees that often. Um, <clears throat> it accounts for about 3% of global cancer diagnoses. It's the sixth most common cancer in the United States. Much like prostate cancer, it impacts older adults, typically men over 55 years of age. Um, the survival rate is not as good as prostate cancer. Typically, we see a lot of metastases associated with this cancer, um, which is why it has such a higher, a higher mortality rate. Um, so <clears throat> about 77% five-year survival rate, and it decreases to about 65% at the 15-year mark. Um, you know, the risk factors for bladder cancer, many of them are similar to prostate cancer and most cancers in the body, smoking, obesity, a lot of those lifestyle um, habits. Although certainly bladder specifically, um, we do see that um, exposure to certain chemicals, including arsenic or other chemicals in dye manufacturing, so rubber, leather, textiles, paint, um, can increase the risk of bladder cancer specifically. Um, and then any other kind of previous cancer treatment, so any radiation or um, cyclophosphamide is a um, chemo drug that is maybe used for um, other types of cancer that can impact the bladder. Um, certainly chronic bladder inflammation, long-term and repeated urinary tract infections, catheter use um, can increase the risk and then certainly a family um, history. So, you know, bladder cancer, the treatments really vary based on the severity of bladder cancer. Um, is it a stage one or a stage four? And then if there are metastases. So for lower grades of bladder cancer, that's typically managed by chemotherapy, um, where they would inject right into the bladder, usually through a catheter. 
Um, there's immunotherapy with this intravesical bacillus helmet-garin. That is basically, that's a bacteria. We actually see causes tuberculosis, but it actually is really quite effective at eating cancer cells in the bladder. Uh, certainly radiation exists, the external beam, which is you know what we think of when we think of radiation. Um, when it comes to what we would do in pelvic floor, usually when we are seeing patients who have had bladder cancer, we're seeing them after surgery. So um, there is a transurethral resection of the bladder tumor where they basically go in through the urethra um, and then cut into the bladder and remove the tumor. I would say more often what we're seeing is a cystectomy, which is either a partial or full removal of the bladder, often done with invasive cancer. And then usually there is a reconstructive surgery following the cystectomy. So the two types of reconstructive surgery that we see are the neobladder and the incontinent diversion. So with incontinent diversion, um, part of the intestine is closed off and turned into a little pouch that connects to the ureters, which carry urine from the kidneys down to the bladder. Um, but this intestine is then connected to a bag outside the body where urine collects in a bag. So much like a colostomy bag, uh, but just for urine. Uh, there is also in the neobladder where, again, intestine is used to create a bladder, but instead of being connected to a bag on the abdomen, this is connected to a urethra, and then you would urinate through the penis um, as per usual. Um, so I would say I have seen one neo, one patient with a neo bladder. That's more, most often what we're going to see. Um, one of the big things that we see clinically following a neo bladder is that patients do not get an urge to urinate. Um, the intestine that's turned into the bladder does not have the same kind of stretch receptors or communication with the brain. So we have to work more on timed voids, scheduling urination to um, make sure that patients aren't incontinent. Um, certainly this is a more involved treatment process. So with the neobladder, a lot of patients deal with incontinence. Um, generally after a cystectomy, um, we may see pain, nearby organ damage, um, intestinal absorption problems, depending on how much intestine was used to create a neobladder or an incontinent diversion pouch. Um, with a cystectomy, the total removal of the bladder, they also remove the prostate and seminal vesicles, so very often erectile dysfunction occurs. Um, and then radiation and then any use of the um, bacteria there, again, fatigue, nausea, diarrhea, rashes, just all kinds of um, things, although those are probably pretty commonly seen even with just general chemo treatment as well. So when we are seeing someone post-op, and we'll just say for the heck of it, um, a cystectomy with a neobladder. Again, we want to work on those pelvic floor muscles. And a lot of patients, when they first come to therapy, I think get confused because we talk a lot about the bowel. Um, and that's actually really important for bladder health because the bladder and the bowel share space in the pelvis, which really isn't a big space. So certainly um, we want to work on avoiding any kind of constipation or any kind of situation where one would have to strain to evacuate their bowels. And so that's actually what these pictures on the right are depicting. We recommend a squatty potty um, to help the pelvic floor muscles relax. Um, so in the picture on the bottom, on the right hand side, this is the pelvic floor right here and it kinks around the bowel and that's normal, but that needs to relax to defecate. Oops. Um, and so we want to help make sure that's relaxing, right? Um, we want to address any muscle tension, any pain. Again, these are pretty involved surgeries. It's not uncommon that the pelvic floor muscles get very irritated and upset after this kind of surgery and they start to spasm, they get trigger points, right? There could be a lot of pain affiliated with those. So we might do stretching or breathing or other kinds of relaxation techniques to promote that in the pelvic floor. 
Um, certainly, we would want to work on pelvic floor muscle exercises using biofeedback, as Liz alluded to, um, regarding the prostate. You know, again, depending on the severity of the cancer, we might, you know, want to work on general strength and endurance, typically recovering from this kind of surgery. It's not uncommon to see fatigue, um, you know, working on healthy habits, again, water intake, really making sure that we're expanding the bladder, bladder drills, fiber. And then this picture on the right, I know is a little small, but this is an example of a bladder training or a bladder diary that we would give a patient with a neobladder just to work on making sure that you're voiding at regular intervals, how much urine are you voiding, making sure that you're emptying completely, um, are you having incontinence, why are you having incontinence, what are you drinking, just to get a better idea of the patterns and work on ways to improve those. So obviously we're biased, there are a lot of benefits of therapy for this, um, certainly it's it's a cheap way to improve outcomes. We'll just leave it there and, and manage expectations, educate the patients. Um, yeah. So moving on to the colorectal cancers, which is actually an area that I treat quite a bit and am very passionate about treating. Um, so just to show you some rectal and anal rectal anatomy. I took this picture at a Body Worlds exhibit um, a couple of weeks ago. And you can see there's the colon up at the top that comes down into the rectum. So this is an actual human anal rectum that's been cut in half. And you can see in this red circle, there is a tumor, cancer tumor. Um, and I just, you know, this is a common location. And so I just wanted everyone to appreciate the proximity of that to um, the anal sphincters, um, the anal canal, which are located below that tumor. Um, and that really has a big impact on recovery from colorectal cancer. So just to give a little overview, um, the main function of the colon is to absorb water and electrolytes back into the body, right? So this is kind of the final pass of material before a bowel movement. Um, so we have the ascending colon, transverse colon at the top, the descending colon that comes down on the left side of your abdominal wall into the sigmoid colon and then into the rectum. So, you know, colon cancer can occur anywhere in this colon, um, in the colon. I would say most often, and what I treat most often are colorectal cancers. So either we'd see that in the sigmoid colon or in the rectum. Now, colon cancer is definitely on the rise. And I've heard that a lot of places are considering lowering the age of first colonoscopy to 45 um, to reflect this. 90% um, of cases occur in people over 50 years of age. Um, it does have a pretty high mortality rate. We've seen 13 million people are estimated to die of colorectal cancer by the year 2030. Um, it's the second most prevalent cancer in women, the third in men, and we see this a lot in developed regions of the world. So a lot of that in, in terms of risk factors is actually attributed to our horrible diet, a lot of red meat consumption, processed meat, processed foods, um, alcohol, heavy smoking, um, obesity, type two diabetes, um, and then certainly thing, you know, people who are dealing with colon polyps that might be removed frequently during colonoscopies, inflammatory bowel diseases. Um, we do tend to see this most commonly in black men um, over the age of 50. And there is quite a hereditary, there is a known genetic link. So the risk of colorectal cancer actually increases if you've had a family history of it. And quite often in those patients, they may start colonoscopies as soon as 30 years old to kind of monitor colon health. So, you know, depending on where the cancer is located um, will certainly dictate the treatment and also the severity of the cancer. Most commonly, we see surgical resection of the cancer. These do have higher metastasis rates. They're usually solid tumors. Generally, the treatment is gonna be to go in and get it out. 
Um, so again, depending on where the tumor is, they may will remove a lot of material around it. So that may impact the anal sphincter, the internal anal sphincter, which we need for fecal continence. Um, and they do these surgeries both open and laparoscopically, again, depending on the extent of the cancer. Typically what we see post-operatively is that patients are given a colostomy bag temporarily, right? They cut the area of the cancer out. They wanna give the colon about six weeks to heal from that surgery. And then they will go back in and reconnect it six plus weeks following. And that's more or less when we're gonna get those patients in physical therapy. There is radiation. I've seen um, that often done post-operatively. Um, they do do radiofrequency ablation or cryoablation um, to freeze out the tumor or kill the cancer cells. Um, and we'll see that more often if there's been uh, metastases. And then at that point, there may not be much benefit to going in and, and physically removing the cancer. Um, they do do brachytherapy where they put radioactive seeds in the tumor, much like they do for the prostate to slow the growth of cancer cells. It's uh, still kind of in the works as to if that's effective chemo and immunotherapy. Um, so the most common effects of colorectal cancer treatments that we see, especially in therapy, are diarrhea and fecal incontinence. I haven't seen many patients with colorectal cancer who deal with constipation. Um, certainly there's a lot of weight loss related to poor absorption in the intestines following that. Um, there can be a related sexual problems, pelvic pain, et cetera. So I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the fecal incontinence that we see postoperatively and, and really why that occurs. Um, so number one, you know, taking out a tumor in the intestines, that's a huge trauma to the intestines. And so typically in a response to that, they start to really like increase their propulsion and push stuff through. So we absorb less and end up having bowel movements more frequently. Now, if there is rectal cancer, when they go in to remove that, they may impact the internal anal sphincter. We do not have voluntary control over that internal anal sphincter. Um, however, the role of that sphincter is to let us know um, that there's material there that we would need to evacuate. So it gives us that bowel urge. It also helps us understand is that solid liquid or gas in the rectum. So when we lose that internal anal sphincter function, very often we're going to see fecal incontinence, right? And oftentimes that material is loose and it comes out without any awareness you might go to the bathroom and see that there's stool in the underwear and it's very frustrating um, to deal with that. So um, as far as what we do in therapy, I mean, we certainly, again, wanna work on muscle tension, anything that's going to um, keep those muscles from operating at their highest potential, breathing, relaxing, stretching, working on any scars. We do wanna work on muscle control. So what we can work on is the external anal sphincter, which we do have voluntary control over and making sure A, that that sphincter is strong, but also that it's contracting at the right times. If you're lifting something up, we want to make sure that that anal sphincter is contracting and that's becoming a little bit more automatic so that you're not having incontinence related to some of these physical activities. Um, we recommend squatty potty for optimal defecation dynamics, um, start to work on a bowel emptying schedule. And then certainly the picture on the right, we wanna work on improving the consistency of the bowel movement. So you can see the, the green dots on the far right side are correlated with the stools that we would like our patients to have. So not type seven diarrhea and not type one, which are the like rabbit turds, but more of a formed stool. Sometimes that's realistic, sometimes that's not, but certainly we wanna try and promote that as best we can. Um, much like with the neo bladder, we'll give our patients with colorectal cancer a kind of a bowel diary. When are you going? What's the stool consistency? Are you, 
you know, passing large volumes of stool or just a little bit, is it painful? Um, are, you know, is it happening in your underwear? Is it happening on the toilet? What are you eating? What, you know, um, are you taking any um, fiber or anything like that? Again, just to work on um, a regular and predictable habit. So as far as our interventions, like, um, I think our big thing is the biofeedback. We often will use a rectal sensor, which is depicted here, so that patients have a little bit more awareness and something they feel like they're squeezing around. Um, that has to be at least six weeks post-op, but we do that quite a bit. General strength, lifestyle modifications, water, fiber, probiotics. Um, now there does take time for these things to improve. So some of the other things that we can encourage our patients to do um, are to, you know, take their adjunct medication. Anyone who's had gut uh, surgery will often be prescribed something called Lamotil, which is basically a modium on steroids um, to really slow down the gut, improve absorption, reduce incontinence. Um, in more severe cases, they'll do just a pure opiate tincture to really slow the gut down where you would put drops on your tongue. Often these patients are seeing dietitians because they've lost so much weight and they're not absorbing as much material as they could. Um, how do we optimize weight gain and health? Um, I have recommended anal plugs before, just while we work on the um, anal sphincter strength. Certainly in more severe cases, patients can go back and just be given an ostomy bag just for long-term use um, if the incontinence never really resolves. Although most of the time it, it does, it gets better. So again, um, PT does improve continence in these patients, definitely improves quality of life, improves bowel function. Um, so it is a really useful thing to do. All right, so I wanna make sure we have a little bit of time for questions. I know we went a little bit over, um, but yes, any questions? Thank you so much for um, the valuable information you guys shared today. Um, for those of you that are on Facebook, you can submit questions through the comment box. Um, and those of you that are on Zoom, please feel free to use the chat function. Um, and you can send it to me or just to everybody in the group here. Um, a, just a, a question that came in privately earlier is, um, you mentioned it could take up to two years recovery for some. Um, how often do you see people in PT to work through that um, treatment? Um, um, go ahead, Liz. I was just going to say um, the two years is typically for erectile dysfunction. And so it really varies. Um, it's not that you're always seeing those people every week for two years, but sometimes we'll see people for a little while in the beginning and then give it more time. Um, and oftentimes those folks will work with a sexual medicine um, doctor. Has that been your experience, Betsy? Yeah, um, you, there is some research for pelvic floor um, exercises on improving erectile health. So, um, you know, usually we'll see patients, at least my rule is a four to six visits weekly, get them going on a home exercise program, Kegels, and then maybe check in, uh, you know, every two weeks, every month, every couple of weeks following um, to get to a point where they're a little bit more comfortable with their symptoms. Um, sometimes we get to a point where we kind of plateau with what we can do in therapy and then it becomes just a time game, but we wanna reinforce the exercises and things at home. Um, I haven't worked with anyone for two years, but I definitely have followed with patients over a year. Again, more for urinary continence that usually improves within the first year. Um, if a, but yes, if, if they're still dealing with erectile function, generally at about a year post-op is when I would encourage them more to follow up with the sexual health nurse. And do you generally see uh, men after a referral or what can, can they do to make sure that they're seen um, earlier by your team? 
we need oh, a referral. <laughs> ask the physician, say you want to go to physical therapy and ask for an order for physical therapy for incontinence or, you know, preoperative rehab. Would you agree, Liz? Yeah, definitely. Um, and usually it's, you know, a urologist um, in the case of um, post-prostate surgery. Um, but yeah, they would need to get a referral from their doctor. And I will say, you know, we definitely don't see a lot of men preoperatively, but even postoperatively, um, I think it, that is definitely an indication to come to pelvic therapy. And I, I would say that there are a lot, probably a larger percentage than I'm even aware of, of men that do not get referred. Um, so even just asking about that, um, following would be a good thing to do, a good way to advocate for yourself. Yeah, that's kind of where I was kind of going with that question. Generally, the people have to advocate for themselves to, to come and see you guys um, yeah. to get some of that treatment. Some doctors are better than others, um, you know, within North Shore and, and beyond. Um, I just find that it's mostly men that have I don't want to say make a big stink because you're not making a big stink if you're incontinent, but the ones that tend to complain a little bit more, be more verbal about those symptoms are the ones that are getting sent. And so I think there are a lot of men that suffer in silence, definitely with incontinence and things post-operatively. Yeah. And I see a comment here on, um, through the Facebook channel is that um, there's a person who mentioned sort of kind of experiencing a roller coaster, um, seven weeks out of reconnection surgery and it has been a little bit frustrating. Um, so the person notes implementing diet and, and adding fiber, I think something that you guys talked about. Yeah, quite a bit. And if you if you're the, the person that left the comment had colorectal cancer, um, sometimes fiber totally backfires. Not everyone can tolerate that, um, but it definitely does. It is an important part of bowel health, but it is a roller coaster. And I would say for any of these surgeries, you're in for a year. And that's what I tell my patients. Like we try to embrace that as best we can. It's a really, can be a really crappy and tough year of recovery, but it does get better. Yeah, and I would note um, the Cancer Wellness Center does have an oncology dietitian on staff. I know North Shore has lots of oncology dietitians too. Often they'll work with you and, and help to make sure that diet is working for you um, in your cancer and your circumstances. Yeah. Um, thank you. I don't think we have any additional questions. Uh, Betsy and Elizabeth, thank you so much for your time today um, for the valuable information you shared with our participants. Um, again, for those of you new, please visit cancerwellness.org to learn more about the center and the services that we do here. Um, and then um, northshore.org for more information on you guys. Awesome. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having us.